hello everyone. So my name is Sarah Atev. I am a, I'm a graduate from Ensal Fejedida. It's a It's a, a school in Morocco. It's an engineering school. I am a computer science and emerging technologies engineer. My specialty is in big data. I mean, officially, but I am more of an enthusiast of deep learning and machine learning. So today we'll be talking about recommender systems and we will focus more importantly on content-based approach. So the plan today is going to be the following. So we will begin first about, so we'll get to know first what are recommender systems, just a refresher. Right after that, we will know the different approaches because there are a lot and we will concentrate on content-based content recommender systems more special, specifically. Right after that, we will have to tackle evaluation metrics so that we can know how we can actually evaluate our recommender systems. And we will finish with an example. About recommender system. So I found the great definition. Actually, they are pretty much the same. So this one says that recommenders, the recommendation systems or recommender systems are algorithms that are designed to understand and predict user preferences based on user behavior. In general, what it means is just what we, tr what we are trying to do through recommender systems is to understand our user better his preferences, how he behaves, what he likes, what he dislikes, so that we can recommend the product to him, whatever that product may be. So what kind of example are there so far? So we have a bunch of, of examples in the industry. Now, pretty much everyone is, is having a part where they have recommender systems in their huge systems so that they can approve their, their sales. So there is Amazon uh, example where when you go shopping in Amazon, there, there is Netflix where you, match, where you watch movies, series, and there is Spotify as well. So all of these actually have, well, each one of them has their own recommender systems, like they have their own architect architecture and they have their own algorithms, specifically uh, specific to, to their use cases. But what is, what is actually, what is actually, uh, this, what is unique to, to each one of them or what is actually the point of intersection between all of them is that they need the user's data to understand the user and give the best recommendations to them. So that is actually the goal of a recommender system. So what are the approaches that there are so far? I was searching for recommender systems. I have seen a lot of approaches, like there are really, really a lot, especially that now it is quite a pretty active field in research. So there are, every time there is a new, a new, a new architecture, a new deep learning model. So we can't really cover all of them, but what is, in, what is the, the thing that I actually saw repeat itself a lot? are these approaches, these main approaches. The content-based, the collaborative filtering method, and the hybrid method. So for the content-based method, what is actually special about it is that we only, we only need the user and the item. So we, we don't really need, for example, other, how other users interacted with our item, nothing like that. We only focus about the user we want to recommend our item to. But for collaborative filtering methods, we need other users' preferences. Like for example, we, can't, we don't really focus only on our user, the one that we are interested to recommend the item to, but we are going to see his, his interactions with the other users so that we can recommend the product to him. For the hybrid method, this one actually is the one used in industry these days, and it, it just takes the best from content-based methods and the best from collaborative filtering methods so that it tackles its cones, and yeah, it gives the best, the best performing model so far. So now, 
we aren't going to talk about hybrid methods because like i said they are they are uh, they are a bit pretty much advanced and each one has their own actual way of 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 even doing hybrid methods like it's a bunch of other methods in hybrid methods but we will be seeing the main methods that are very very important to know about in in recommender systems so there is like i said before the collaborative filtering and the content based filtering so for the collaborative filtering as i explained before what we need is other users preferences not just our own not just our own user preference so for example let's say a read for example this article and we saw before that a has read that b has read an article that a has a reader it so we so we will compute the similarities between these two users and recommend what a has actually read to our user b but in content-based filtering what is important to us is actually what just our own user have read and we will try to find an item that is similar to what he has read and recommend it to him. Okay, so if you have any questions, please use the link I, I gave you or just follow this link so that you can ask them. So I'm going to move on until, until you, you, you post me some. So what, is, what we are interested about today, more specifically, are content-based recommender systems. I will tell you later why we choose content recommender based systems instead of the collaborative ones. Okay. So first, what is a content-based filtering system? So we will use a, a, a definition used by Google in one of its courses about recommender systems that says content-based filtering uses item features to recommend other items similar to what the user likes based on their previous actions or explicit feedback so what does it mean so after i buy the after i bought the iphone and i mean i rated it the high rating you will try to actually give me suggestions that are going to be similar to that item features for example you're going to perhaps try to to suggest me the latest iPhone there, there is in the market, or perhaps you will you will you will suggest me another brand, but that has the same features as that iPhone. So we will be actually focusing on that item that I bought and extract its features. Perhaps the features could be something like uh, the, the 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 RAM of its RAM, or for example, its camera. Or these are the things that you will be trying to focus on to actually suggest to me the item. Sorry. So in content-based models, what we do after we have our data uh, to try to know what we can actually recommend, we actually compute the similarity. For example, how similar a certain item that is new, or that is new, and you want to try to recommend, you are going to try to compute the similarity of that new item with an item that I have previously bought, purchased, or rated. So this is the, this is the, the, the principle so that you can recommend to me this item. This is the, the simple approach. There are several ways you can actually compute similarity. There is the cosine similarity, the dot product, and the Euclidean distance. So for the cosine, the higher the angle, uh, sorry, the higher, the, higher the, the, the value of the cosine that is going to be in between zero and one. So the closest it is to one, the most, the similar, what I bought is similar to the item that, that you computed the similarity of. For the dot product, the higher the distance, between this sorry the higher the this the, the higher the value of this dot product the best the better it is but for the euclidean distance the smallest the distance the more similar the your your item you want to recommend to me is to the one i actually already bought so 
we have gone a little bit too deep into the theoretical part. Let's take an example. So for this example, we, we, have, we have several applications. Uh, this is, a, this is a, uh, from the Google Play Store. It's an example taken from the Google, uh, uh, Google course about recommendation systems. So we, what we'll try to do is hand engineer some features for the Google Play Store. So we have our user, as for example, say it's me, you have, you have, you have me, <laughs> you have my preferences. Like for example, here I'm interested about education and I installed an app that is called Science R Us. And when I was filling details about myself, I told you I was interested about healthcare. So here we have points where uh, points about uh, the the things I told you about, or that you did use it. For example, after I installed the app, and we have several several applications that you want to try and recommend. So what we will do is here we have our data about each item we have here for example the first app is an education and as the producer for example is a science or has the same is the same developer it has the same developer as the one i installed and then for this one for example it's a casual app that is that is the for its developer is time master and etc so what we will do here is we will compute this, the dot product, one of our similarity measures, between what I like, the, the, the vector you have about me, about my preferences, and the other apps, the features of the other apps. These are called features. So if we start with the closest one here, the third one, if impute, we can see that the only similarity between us, if we take these as one, for example, and if there is no dot, it's zero. If we take, if we compute these, if we compute th this factor with this, you can find that where we are similar is in healthcare, for example. Okay, so here we have one. In this one, we have zero. There is no similarity. But in the first one, we have to. So the one that you are going to most, to most likely recommend to me is the first application because we have the, we have the most similar feature between, between my preferences and its features. So this is what we are explaining in this part. Okay. So usually, in problems when it comes to content-based approach, we have either this classical one where we have users' data and you will compute similarity between them and then you will recommend to me, or a problem could actually be either a classification problem, for example, if you want to predict if the user actually likes or dislikes an item, or it could be a regression prob problem if you are trying to predict the rating I might give to an item. And in these cases, if we have this kind of concepts, what we, what we do is we apply machine learning algorithms, for example, classification algorithms like logistic regression, and for regression problems, we may apply linear regression, for example. Now, what are the pros of using content-based approach, approaches? So if we use content-based approaches models, the model won't need any data about other users, like I explained before, since the recommendations are specific to this user. This makes it easier to scale to a large number of users. And secondly, the model can capture the specific interests of a user and you can recommend niche items that very few other users are interested in. In general, what do, what do they mean by this? For example, when we, when, if I were to think about using collaborative filtering approach and not a content-based approach, but the problem is that, for example, I just developed the app 
let's say, for example, I developed an Amazon app, something similar, but I don't have a user's rating. Like I just started, my app is still new. I have nothing about my users. So here I will fall into the problem of cold start problem, which means I have no data that I, that I can use, so I can train my model. But for example, if we use the content-based approach and we ask the user to cooperate with us and rate some items, it will be easier for us to recommend them new items. In the second case, where here they want to say that through the content-based approach, we will be able to focus on the user's likes. Like for example, everything will be tailored to him. For example, if you're going to, to if I am going, it's like, it's like clothes. If I am going to actually sue some, they are going to have to be using my own measures. This is the model. The model will follow my own measures, and, but it, it will not take into consideration others. In this case, let's see the cons of this. So, since the feature representation of the items, the, the ones that, the, that we will try to pick, are going to be hand engineers. Hand engineers means we are going to be the one that are going to tell which features, which features sorry, are actually going to be important to some extent. So this technique requires a lot of domain knowledge. For example, if I don't understand uh, the domain knowledge, like let's say, for example, it's, it's a healthcare app and I am going to suggest or recommend some kind of medicaments. If I don't, if I am not a healthcare professional, I can't, I can't go around hand picking the, the best features that are going to fit my problem. Therefore, the model can, be only, can only be as good as the hand engineered features, normal. The model, for the second case, the model can only make recommendations based on existing interests of the user. In other words, the model has limited ability to expand on the user's existing interests. What does this mean? Remember I told you here we will tailor our model according to that user? measures user, for example. Here, we will fall into the problem where it will be difficult for us to recommend to that user an item that has never been put in the store, or for example, an item that he has never rated, or an item that his own preferences that he gave us ne will not meet. But we aren't sure if that item actually, if he, if he or she will like that item because a person doesn't tell you everything about himself or herself. She isn't going to tell you she, she, she likes or her likes or, or her dislikes. Sometimes even you yourself, you wouldn't know that you can like something until you try it. So here we may, we may fall into the problem where we, we, we won't be able to recommend something new and that he may, he may like. So let's take the questions before we move on. So how would we get a user's preferences? Would we monitor their activity using our based language and then store their clicks and hovers in a backend database and then use a different recommendation formulas to look through their information? We'll talk about our own use case, how we are going to get user's preferences. So what we could, if we, if we, already have, for example, some likes already registered, or if we already have some, 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 some data about that user, it will be good. We can use that to, to, to compute similarities. Now, in the case where we don't have this data, what we can do is we can, for example, ask the user to, to fill in some, 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 some information about himself. Of course, we shouldn't overdo it, like just one or three keywords that are important to us that can help us recommend new items to him or her. And of course, we will store this information. Sometimes we can even like ask him to do a quiz or give him a bunch of items, different ones, of course, because we don't want to overwhelm him or her, and ask him or her to rate or choose one of them. 
I hope I answered your question. Okay, I will, I will continue and then go back to all the questions you have later. So, now we have seen how we can compute the similarity, what kind of things we can try to, to form our model. Now, what we want to know is how we can evaluate that model. Like, how are we going to know if it's performing well or not? So there are different, ma different metrics we can try according to our, to our problem. For example, here, there are metrics-based evaluation. For metrics-based evaluation, if our output is actually numerical, for example, ratings, we could use MSA, mean squared error, on some other error metrics. Or we can use, if the output is non-numerical, like for example, like or dislike, we could use classification metrics like accuracy, precision, or recall. They are very well known in machine learning cases. Now, let's say, for example, we, after using these metrics, perhaps, we couldn't cover everything. So usually that happens in real life. What we mean by everything is we can't assess diversity. What do we mean by diversity first? For example, we can't, we can't assess if our recommendations are different. Like, they aren't always the same. You, we don't always fall in a routine where we always are kind of suggesting things that are similar. So we need to ensure that there is diversity. So there is a fresh read to the, to the items we recommend. We have to ensure there is explainability. What do we mean by explainability? Actually, what we mean by explainability is, for example, if you remember the first examples, the Netflix one or the Amazon one, they actually are recommending something to you, but they are telling you why they are recommending that thing. For example, they told you, you watched this or you bought this. That is why we are recommending you this or this. So they are giving you the reasons of, their recommend of these recommendations. Now, the real problem that we face most of the time is that we want to assess the quality of a recommendation. But the problem is the user has never actually rated that recommendation. How can we know in real life if the recommendation is the right one for our user? And it, this is, of course, before going into production, like before we, the, the, the app can be used by other users. Sometimes we would like to know if what was recommended is actually right or not, or close to what the user may like. So how can we know if a new recommendation is relevant before actually recommending it to our user? To know these kind of things, what we can do is test the model in real life conditions. The things that could be used is putting the system in actual production. So we are going to take a risk. We could take a risk and launch the, the product. So this can be used by our users. And then use an, a testing approach called A slash B testing. Or what we can do is ask our users to test our app. But of course, not all, not all users, but just a bunch of ones. This is usually, this has been used a lot, a, a, a lot of, a lot in the past. I don't know now if they are still using it, but uh, I think they are still using some kind of it. Like, for example, if you have ever filled a survey about a product, they're telling you if it's, yeah, if it's, if it meets your requirements or not. I think in Facebook, they are using something similar, but they are using it like uh, not in a way that you can see it uh, um, like, yeah, just like that. For example, when they, when, when, you rec when they recommend something to you and sometimes it's offensive or it's not, met, it's not meeting your expectations, you ask to, there are some three, there are three dots above the publications or the recommendation. And you can, for example, choose one of the, of the things where you say why you don't want to see that recommendation or that, that recommendation or that part. So this is called testing. 
So we are not sure that we are meeting the user's requirements, but we are doing some other ways to test if we are meeting their expectations or not. But the problem is that this process requires that we at least have some kind of, of confidence in the model we are using. For example, if we aren't at least 90% sure that our, our, our model performs well in general situations, we can't really just go around and throw it and give it to our user to, to test just like that. We will, be, we will be facing a lot of backlash and we may even lose, for example, our app or we won't get a lot of revenue. Are there any questions? There's only one. No questions, should I move on? So let us see the example. Ah, oh, yes. First things first, I took the example from this person, Black Raven or James NG. Yeah, he, he actually did a demo about move recommender systems. You can check it out yourself later. I will be leaving you my collab link if you want to play with it. So let me first try what he done, what he, what he tried to do. So first things first. What are we trying to do? So we're trying to build a movie recommender system using the content-based approach. What he did is he captured data from data.world. It's an IMDB. He took the 250 English movies from it. So he downloaded the data. If you can see the data here, there are a lot of features. These we call them features, usually in machine learning models. Features or stuff that are that categorizes our, for example, here the movie. Of course, it has appeared in a certain year. It was it has a certain rating. It was released in a certain date. Stuff like that. So, but he will be keeping only five useful columns. In this case, he had engineered them, which means he picked these features because he thought they were important. So he picked the title. I think this is a normal thing. He picked the director, actors, plot, and genre. So he used this so that he can recommend. Movie to new users. So here he is just exploring the, the data. You can have fun going through this. It's always interesting to explore the data and try to understand it. So here you will see that the most frequent genre is actually a drama genre and yeah, and a lot about crime. And he visualized the 10 popular directors. Sometimes some people love, for example, uh, a certain, uh, movies of a certain di director because he, for example, you know, the movies he produces are similar to the tastes they have usually. So in every NLP problem, we always have to do data preprocessing. And what this data preprocessing actually means usually is to remove stop words. What do we mean by stop words? Like we will remove A, the, stuff that are linking, linking what we call linking words in a sentence. He will, we will get rid of punctuation, white space, and convert all words to lowercase so that we can unify them and know how much they have been used in our text, for example. So here, what, where we are going to do this pre-processing, we are going to focus our pre-processing on plot because the plot is where you can say that we have a resume or abstract of what the movie is all about. So this is the one we're most interested about. It is the one that is going to give us the item features here, the movie features, or, make, or what makes our movie yeah, special or interesting or different from other movies. So 
what we're going to do overall in the next steps is pre-process the data. So, and after pre-processing it, we are going to get all of these columns, the ones that are interesting to us, our features, we are going to get them in one column. And then we are going to pick the frequency of each word. For example, in plot here, we are going to pick the frequency of each word in plot so that we can know, uh, for example, in our in recommended movie, what is similar between the, 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 the plot or the, yeah, the plot that our user liked and the plot that we may want to recommend to him. So after actually getting the frequency of each word in a plot, we are going to try to convert these words into numbers because our models cannot, doesn't accept words, they can't comprehend them, but they accept numbers, they deal goodly with numbers. So we are going to convert our words into numbers by vectorizing them, by transforming them into vectors. Where we will, where scores are going to be a signal to each word, like I told you before. Each, let me show you the exact example. So here first, we are going to do pre-processing by removing stop words, punctuation, white space, white space, and then covering everything, covering everything into into lowercase. Right after doing that, we are going to pick the most used words, or get, we're going to compute the scores of the words. The scores is how many times the word has been repeated in a sentence. So for example, this is a, the sentence that we have, is we're going to remove, to remove the stuff I told you about before, stop words and punctuation, etc. And then after doing that, we're going to transform it into lowercase. Right after this, we're going to compute the score of each word. For ex but remember that we need to get rid of stop words. They, they, are, they, are, they don't really have a, a special meaning in our case, for example. So here, let's say, let's search for accused. Here you can see that accused has been reported only once. We don't have it repeated more than once. Cheating once, Indian has been reported two times. We have Indian here. And we may have actually Indian somewhere else in this, in this plot. Uh, there is millionaire as well, has been reported only once. Uh, Mumbai has been reported three times. So there is Mumbai here. And yeah, okay, so here we don't have the whole plot. So if you go to that specific plot and print, print it all, you will see that it's re repeated a lot of times. And you will see that the number frequency of each word is actually reported here. Okay, so this is just to get our words into shape so that it makes us easier to transform it into numbers or vectors. So after that, what he's going to do is he's going to, to get rid of the space between the name of the director and his family name. Why? So that it can actually, so that it can actually become like an identifier. Like for example, in some cases, some people have same family name. There are some people, who, even though they are different from different families, some people have same names. So we need to get rid of that. We need something that is identical to that person and we won't have repeated, but they are different. We don't want to fall in this trap. So he put them as an identifier, like he, you know, he put them together. He, for actors, he only picked the three. And uh, because we have a lot, if you can see it here, we have a lot of actors, more than three. So he picked only three. Sorry about that. And then for genre, well, for genre we already had the comma between each genre. So he didn't do much. He's just transformed them into lowercase and he transformed everything into lists 
for easier conception by algorithms. So after doing this, what he will do is he will get all of these, like the director, the actors, and the plot, and the genre. He will all combine them into one into one column. Here for the plot, he didn't take our plot, the previous one, but the one we pre-processed, where we removed the stop words and transformed everything lower keys. He took these keywords and mixed them with the other columns, like is explained in this schema. So what, what he did is actually called bag of words, like he so he tried to put all of these uh, important features into one single column so that it will be easier to, to represent them into a vector. And this process is called bag of words. And if you're curious about how it's, it's actually done, even though I already explained the process, but you can check this video out. I left the, the link here so you can check it out later. Okay, so after getting all of our data here into one column, but of course you have the title because we still want us want to still want to have some reference that is quite clear so that we the user can search by that. But this is what is important. Like these are the features, the, our movies features. What makes our movie unique, if you may say. So after getting all of these into words that can be processed and turned into vectors, we're going to use the count vectorizer technique so that we can transform these words into vectors. Right after that, we will compute the similarity. So for similarity, what, we're try what we are trying to do is generate a matrix, a constant similarity matrix of size 250x250. Remember, we only have 250 movies. That's why we have a dimension of 250 by 250. Our rows, we represent the movies as well as our columns. For the constant similarity, if you remember, uh, I said that we will try to compute the cosinus of our angle, the angle between the vector, for example, here, our first movie, the one, let's say, our user liked, and some prospective movies we may want to recommend to him. So we're going to compute the similarity between these two. And usually a cosinus is between, the value is between zero and one. So if it's zero, it's actually different. But if it's one, it's highly similar. If it's close, our value is close to one, to one. we want actually to recommend that movie to, to our user. So all the numbers in the diagonal, if you check them here, you will find that they are one, which is normal, because every movie is, of course, identical to itself. For the matrix, obviously it's going to be symmetrical because the similarity between A and B is the same as between, a, as between B and A. For other values, for example, here, like 0 0.15, movie X and movie Y has similarity value of, for example, 0 0.15. It means, for example, that movie one, for example, has a, matter, has a similarity of 0 0.15 with, 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 zero, with movie zero. And remember that what we want is our similarity to be close to one so that we can recommend it to our user. It means that if it's close to one, it means they are pretty similar. So our user may like that movie if we recommend it. So yeah. That's it, we're just going to wrap up everything in a function and call our function. But he, what we're recommending, he should recommend the top 10 movies that are close to the movie he's interested. He, he for example, he has a rating for, from his user. 
So for example, here he, he is trying to find similar movies to The Dark Knight, and he got The Dark Knight Rises, Batman Begins, and yeah, I checked these movies, they are actually quite pretty similar to this Dark Knight. So yes, you can play with it, actually it's fun. <laughs> It, this is this helps you understand how it actually works in your usual mm, app like Spotify or Shopify or even Netflix or Amazon. So that was it for our demo. As a closing, I guess for the for the notebook you will find the link here. You can just click on it and you will find it directly. You can play with it as you would like. I shared it already with you. So as a closing, I would like to say that usually every, every case or recommender, if you are one of build a good recommender system, it's best to do some research and try to find the one that is going to fit your own case. For example, sometimes you have a lot of data and but you don't know what is the best what is the best model to choose it's best to actually do some kind of research and see what other people did in your case for example for for what are for example the best features you can pick for your own model it's best again to research see what other people that are that have done a lot of research in it what they propose to do and then try until you get the one that is the one that is going to fit your own case the best. Yeah, I mean, in machine learning in general, it's always about failure, testing, trial, and at the end, you will succeed. This is usually what we do. For example, for our case here, like I told you why we choose content-based, because we will be facing a cold start problem if we use the collaborative filtering one, because we don't already have the data, we will be scrapping them, and then we may fall in the case where, where our user didn't rate any article. So yeah, so we will have to tackle these things. And sometimes we may even have to research for, for example, for the, the features that we are going to pick. But if I understood correctly, here the features are already set. So yeah, we won't need a lot of, we won't really need to search about them. Here the challenge is going more to be about the data, how we're going to, clean the data, get it in a, into a format that is going to be easier for us to work our algorithms on. And it's going to be pretty similar to what is done here. So yeah, thank you for your attention. And I hope you got the idea. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yes. Do the eigenvalues of the symmetric matrix give us any information? Uh, actually, I'm not sure if they can give us something interesting from in interesting information because I didn't see it being mentioned. But perhaps if we search, maybe we can we, maybe we can try that they are actually helpful in some other ways. Yes, of ca some kind of mean. But I didn't find it when when I was. Uh, when I was researching or when I was reading about content-based. But what I saw and is that it is interesting if we can get, for example, this matrix that you see here, but this is for a content-based filtering approach, is that the, it is interesting if we can get this, this matrix into, into, into a matrix that, that is composed of two small matrices one that has items features and the other that has user features. But this is not for content-based approach. It's for collaborative-based approach where we are interested to have these small matrices and then we can multiply them to have our huge matrix that we had before so that we can tackle the problem of sparsity. I hope it responds to your questions. But if you want, we can, yeah, we can research it. Are there any other questions? I don't see anything else, Sarah, but that was very, very useful. Uh, going for an example was a great idea. It was uh, really helps, and now people can really? take a thought at <laughs> I hope I didn't confuse you, though. I asked just one thing. For example, when, when I am 
using a link or using a resource for an image or even this text, for example, you can just click on it and you will be brought to, to where I, or I found it. Yeah, it's maybe interesting, for example, to read, to read these. I actually found them really, really helpful, especially this article. I like this a lot. It details how, how recommender systems works, what are their drawbacks, yeah, what, how can we surpass these drawbacks? I have some. I really totally recommend you to, to read it. So yeah, every, every slide has its, has its link if you're interested to check them out. Yeah, that's a really great way of presenting it. So, uh, if people want to, especially who are a bit new to it, they can try it out before like a sample code that you already have. Uh, I mean, I hadn't looked at your presentation before I was following along and I think this is very, very useful. So thank you so much, uh, Sarah. It's you are welcome, you are welcome. Great to have you as part of our STEM teams and, uh, and so many people are saying thank you directly to you right now. It's uh, very useful, thank you. Thank you, all the pressure is mine.